Hello everybody. Today's topic is prescri prescribed fire equipment and safety and use for that matter. So um, the first part which we're gonna um, not really talk about in too much depth because it's really um, it's something that I go over in uh, wildland fire ecology but um, really for this lecture I want to focus on the equipment safety and use but really that all ties back to your planning and logistics so making sure that you have thought this whole thing out making sure that it is um, it is ready to go it is you have done all the considerations to make sure that the people involved are protected and being safe and know what they're doing and are fully prepared for what may happen because you never know um, with fire whether you know you'll get a wind shift or you'll get um, you know a little too much fuel or an area was drier than you thought those sorts of things will happen and you have to be prepared for them you have to have a plan in place and you have to really make sure that the people who are working for you are comfortable with what they're doing and know what they're doing so that they can um, succeed to the best of their ability and so um, just with that, so here's your basic idea of doing a prescribed burn if it's something that we're not comfortable with. So in this case, um, they're, they're burning, they're doing a backfire, which means that they're uh, burning into the wind. So you can see up top here, the wind direction is this way, but the fire is burning this way. And the way that they're doing that is that this crew of people here, we've got a in an igniter or a burner depending on the language that you use who's going out there and in this case they're making these little spots and then those spots will grow together and eventually will grow into this fire by burning back to the main fire that's why it's called the back fire because you're lighting up ahead and having the fire burn back into itself uh, we have a black line area set up here so that basically what that is is that's the area where um, where we've decided to start our burn and we made sure that that we had some place some place where we know it can't burn so we're we can work from behind this fire notice how pretty much everybody is behind the fire except for these people the, the igniter everybody else is working behind it because in the black is the area where you're going to be safe uh, if you can in the area that you have that you're going to use a natural fire break and then in terms of personnel, we want to have enough people to be able to do the job. So we're going to definitely need somebody running a torch because we're going to be lighting the ground on fire. We're going to need somebody with tools just to make sure. Um, notice that the majority of people are on this side because that's the side where you've got other um, grass and forest that we don't want to burn up. And we've got some people back here as well. And then we've got a truck um, that either has water or foam. Uh, whatever is available to you to, uh, just so we have another thing that we can use to, to put out the fire Oops. all right and so let's talk about the equipment that you're going to use this is um, kind of a typical look that you'll see especially with wildland fire um, personnel who are doing prescribed burns uh, but let's kind of go into um, all the different pieces of it and so the first one for me when we're talking about being safe uh, in doing prescribed fire is um, personal protective equipment or PPE. And so PPE is defined as the safety gear issued um, that is designed to help uh, protect the firefighter when it is properly used and maintained. And so when we're talking about uh, proper use of PPE, we're really talking about um, things that uh, that you can put on yourself to prevent yourself from injury so in terms of clothing it's usually flame resistant clothing um, nomex is the term that you'll hear all the time and that's a, a trade name for a flame resistant but not fireproof type of clothing and they make um, they make nomex um, uh, shirts and pants they make nomex sweaters um, I think some gloves have some nomex in them um, it's important to remember that when we're talking about this stuff, we're talking about flame resistant clothing, but not fireproof. So if you put, you throw a piece of Nomex clothing into the fire, it will burn up, but it'll take a little, 
a little while to to burn up but it is not fireproof it is not you're not going out in turnouts or anything like that it is flame resistant so it it's it can handle heat but it's not there to really um keep fire away from you that's your job is to keep the fire away from you um other personal protective equipment that becomes important leather boots uh, and making sure that they're really um, leather and not um, a lot of uh, plastic or rubber because that stuff can melt at the higher temperatures you'll see on some prescribed burns. Uh, leather gloves, same thing with the gloves, making sure we don't have any plastic or rubber on our gloves because that can melt to us. Uh, usually some sort of eye protection, um, maybe a helmet if we're in the forest and we're worried about branches or cones or other things falling down. And then... Um, Definitely, when you're um, just like the gloves and the and the boots, you also want to think about uh, your eye protection. Making sure if you're using um, a lot of eye protection these days, have have pieces of rubber on the back side. So make sure um, that you, if you can, don't use those types because I actually have had that rubber melt onto my skin before, and it didn't hurt that bad, but it also didn't feel great. So it's something to think about. So when we're talking about PPE, we want to be covered from head to toe in um, whatever we can. And so um, some a helmet if we're in the forest, um, eye protection. Uh, if you're going to be running any loud equipment or anything, maybe ear protection as well. Um, gloves, uh, Nomex, shirt and pants if we can. If not, then we want um, cotton clothing. And when we're, when we have that clothing, we, we want to actually, um, not just to look nice, but we want to actually keep it tucked in because, um, when things are tucked in, then we can guarantee that our body parts aren't being exposed. So, um, on the fire line, you'll usually see me, I've got on, I'll definitely have on long pants and long shirts, even if it's 105 degrees in the middle of summer, I'm going to be, I'm going to have on long pants and long shirts because I don't want my skin exposed to that heat i want some sort of protection to it and um really you are actually better off with um uh, with everything tucked in if you can and you also want clean things you don't want to have any ppe that has gas oil or other flammable material on it which uh if you're doing a lot of prescribed brands it's actually kind of hard to keep some of that stuff off of you or just make sure that it's been washed because that stuff can be flammable, and remember, our our clothing is only flame resistant. It's not fireproof, so really important to make sure that we're protecting ourselves as much as we can. And so, what does that look like? If you're um, working for the the feds or the state, you'll see um, you'll probably be given the more traditional Nomex of yellow shirt, green uh, Nomex pants, and then leather gloves helmet, eye protection. That's um, that's very typical if you're working a wildland fire job. If you're just out uh, doing this on your own or you're a independent consultant or that sort of a thing, long sleeve shirt, um, some sort of work pants. Usually a lot of people will wear um, Carhartt pants, uh, probably a hat, eye protection, leather gloves, and then um, both of these people are, are wearing leather boots. And that's kind of that is what you need in terms of your basic PPE. Would it be great if we all had Nomex? Absolutely. But can a um, long sleeve shirt and long pants um, and a good belt? Good belt can be important sometimes. Um, are those important as well? Yes. Now, the one big thing to take into consideration if you're not wearing Nomex is to wear things that are 100% cotton. Um, so jeans work out um, really well in that case as well um, but the idea is if you wear any of those um, other fibers polyester type fibers they can melt because they melt at a um, at a at a lower temperature than uh, than cotton does so if you're going to if you're not going to wear Nomex make sure what you're wearing is 100% cotton so that um, so that you have a better chance of it not melting and sticking to you if you don't have a choice then you want to have Whatever you wear, have it have a the highest percentage of cotton uh, that you have, and then just kind of keep an eye and think about it, and make sure your shirt's not just tight that day, that it's not actually like sticking to you, that it's just 
tight fitting. And notice both of them, everything's all tucked in, nothing's hanging out and loose because we don't want to expose our skin to, to the, the heat of the fire. So um, I would suggest pausing the video right here and then going on to the PDF slides and then clicking on these videos as it's a video from Iowa, a two-part video from Iowa State where they go over all of these tools uh, for prescribed burning so you get somebody else's opinion and then you can hear what I have to say about it. And so then let's kind of just continue with equipment. So uh, in dealing with prescribed burning, the, the most uh, popular piece of equipment and the most um, uh, interesting and kind of influential piece of equipment for getting prescribed burns done is the drip torch because the drip torch is how we're actually going to light the ground on fire. Um, I've attached two videos here. Um, so if you want to press pause again, you watch this one on, on the drip torch just kind of goes over the, the basics of it. And then um, the second video is somebody actually doing a demonstration with the dip torch and kind of talking people through the steps. Um, for me, the, the biggest thing with uh, the drip torch is just the idea of um, understanding that you're going to be uh, putting fire on the ground out of it. And so one of the things with operating a drip torch, for me, that's a big deal is making sure that you know um, what you're lighting and when you're lighting at all times. So making sure you pay attention to where you're pointing the can, making sure that if you take a break, you're holding the can up so that you're not dripping fire anywhere and that you don't just hold the can behind you as you walk around. You make sure you know all the places that you're putting fire down on the ground. So here's just a couple more examples of um, of people uh, doing prescribed burning and using a drip torch, and you can see these um, have that they have that more typical look of the Nomex and the uh, Nomex pants and shirt. Uh, they got the leather boots on, the gloves, all the typical stuff. And um, one thing that I think is really important with operating a drip torch, which which both of them. Um, have right here is they made sure that their their wick and their fuel that's coming out the right way because the fuel is dropping onto the wick and then dropping onto the ground and then also they're both running the torch off to the side they're not um, just holding it behind them and they're not dropping fire in front of them where they have to kind of step over the fire they're making sure that what they're lighting is off to the off to the side here's another example um, this person's got a uh, mask or face shield, however you want to call it on because it's, it's getting pretty smoky. But notice, once again, off to the side, uh, the drip torch is set up in the correct manner. And they're putting a good amount of fuel on the, on the ground. And you can see they've kind of, you can see that black behind them. So they started back here and they're working their way this, this way. You can also notice right here there's a little stream of water because there's somebody following behind them with either a backpack pump or a um, or some sort of a water tank. We'll talk about that in a little bit. There is also um, there's all sorts of ways to put fire on the ground if you're um, lucky enough uh, to get to run an ATV torch it's it seems like it's a uh, it's kind of fun. I've been around um, when somebody's been using it I haven't been able to to drive it and use it myself but it seems like a um, pretty interesting way to put fire on the ground but basically you've got a, a propane tank and a little propane torch and you're um, putting fire on the ground uh, while you're driving around on the ATV so um, you can pause the video here and read through this torch guide that um, kind of gives you um, uh, directions on um, on ATV use uh, with a torch and then a video here showing uh, an ATV uh, torch in operation. And so um, what then becomes important as well in terms of uh, both the ATV torch and um, the drip torch is making sure that we get our mix in our torch uh, correct 
for for whatever we're doing. Now, um, the big thing to know is that you're going to have a mixture of diesel and gas fuel in your drip mix. Uh, I put actually two different videos here. So once again, you can pause and um, take a look at both of those videos. But the big thing for me um, with the drip mix is that you're going to see people have differing opinions. Um, if you actually read through the comments on those YouTube videos, you'll actually see somebody who, who said, well, it should be 50-50 between um, diesel and gas, um, where both of these um, um, videos had different versions of, of the proper amount, whether it's um, 3 to 1 or 60-40 or however you want to think about it. The big thing to remember is um, is just the difference between diesel and gas. So um, the diesel is there because the diesel will stick to the ground longer and and, and um, kind of resonate a little bit more, whereas the gas is really the thing that, that is um, lighting things on fire. And so why you want to have this mixture of both of them is because you want things to light on fire right away, but you also want it to last a little bit behind to get we're putting a little bit of fuel uh, onto the onto the ground and trying to get areas to burn and then match up to the rest of the fire. We need it to last a little bit, so it needs to have that mixture of both diesel and gas in it. So, um, are we gonna say, is uh, am I gonna say what is my preferred method or my preferred mixture? No, because I think it really depends on where you're working and what fuel. You're dealing with do you need more resonance time or do you need it to just kind of get up and go like if I was dealing with uh, just to give you some examples if I was doing a burn in grass I'd probably go a little more 50 50 because the grass is probably um, whether it's short grass or tall grass it doesn't um, it catches fire easily and it doesn't need to stay there in a long time because it's gonna burn fast so I'd probably go with a little more 50 50 there to try and get it to burn clean through the gas. Um, and that's another difference. Do I want it to burn clean or do I want it to burn kind of patchy and be um, more of a mosaic um, for forests? I know, I know it'll take a little bit longer because it might be wetter. So I definitely want it to have more resonance time. So it's going to be a much more of a diesel, um, heavier to diesel mix than, than heavier to gas. So it'll be maybe a 70 um, 70 percent diesel 30 percent gas or 60 percent diesel 40 percent gas mix um, because I want it to last longer if we're trying to burn in in the forest where where it might be wetter so it really depends on what I'm trying to accomplish with my burn and where I'm burning and how fast I want things to burn and so then the other, uh, another part of um, prescribed fire is hand tools. And the, the key part of the hand tools, um, we've talked about the, the drip torch already, but um, some of these other ones, the swatter, the rake, um, the McLeod combo tool, Pulaski, these are the ones that are basically going to be there to remove the fuel. So we have the idea of the fire triangle being fuel, heat, and oxygen. And so if we remove the fuel from that equation, then the fire goes out. And so on the parts where anywhere where we don't have a natural fire break, we're probably going to use um, hand tools or we're going to use water to create a fire break for us. And so um, these are just some examples of some hand tools. And these are what they, they look like. So up here in the top left, uh, this person's carrying the McLeod. We've got a fire rake right here leaning on this piece of wood. This is the swatter or the flapper, which um, if you watched that Iowa State video, uh, the guy said that it has a poor name, and I agree with him because what it should be called is the, the dragger or the smotherer or something like that because really I'm taking that and I'm just... I'm just dragging it along the ground. I want to, I'm using that one actually not to remove the, the fuel, which is what um, the other ones are being, um, being used for. I'm using that one to actually remove the oxygen by basically just putting it on top of the fire and on top of the ground. I take out the oxygen component in the fire triangle. We've got our regular old fire shovel. 
Uh, we've got the leaf blower, which um, does does have its uses in prescribed fire, especially in an area where um, you might be lacking wind to, to push the fire. And then this is a combination tool where you got um, like some sort of a pick on one side and then something that's a hoe or a shovel on the other side. Now the other part um, for these areas where we don't have natural fire breaks um, is, is water. And the use of water either through a backpack pump, uh, you can see a backpack pump right here and that's what these people are wearing as they're trying to keep the fire from burning into this area behind them. And this is also, this is the front side of the backpack pump. So there is the actual um, pump and you're basically just pumping it as the water comes out or you'll see some sort of a tank now you could have uh, some sort of a water tank you can have this being pulled in like in this picture on an ATV with a with a hose attached to it you might just have a fire engine um, there it might just be a a trailer that you hook up to any truck um, that has the water tank uh, but same idea we're going to just kind of follow along and create ourselves a fire break by um, by putting water on the fire. So going back to the fire triangle, fuel, heat, and oxygen. This one, water takes takes away um, the heat element. So with our hand tools, we were trying to take away the fuel, or specifically with the um, the swatter or the flapper, trying to take away the oxygen. And when we're putting water on the fire here, we're trying to take away the heat. And then um, one of the other really important things to, to keep in mind, not only before we do prescribed fire, but during the prescribed fire and even a little bit after the prescribed fire is keeping track of the weather. And the way that this used to be done was through a belt weather kit where you had to use a sling, like, sling psychrometer and you had to sit there and like... Um, get get this uh get your your bulb for your thermometer wet and you'd have to like sling it in the air and then take a few readings and then check a chart and all that but nowadays we have these kestrels and so you just hold this thing on the sides and you, you put it into the wind and it tells you the wind speed and tells you the temperature that's the little um, bulb for the temperature and if you get um, even the fancier models they can tell you a whole bunch of information about um, about fire that uh, is really important. So I've attached a YouTube video. You can pause uh, the lecture once again and watch that video about how to use a kestrel. And then the last piece of it is um, depending on the size uh, and area that you're burning or the topography because you might not be able to see people is it's really important to stay in communication whether that's in um, through radios or hand signals or cell phones or however it is that you're staying in communication, it's really important to make sure that you have communication set up. Um, just it's one of the four basics when it comes to uh, wildland fire. And I think um, that it's still, it's still very important when we think about prescribed fire as well. The four basics being lookouts, communications, escape routes, and safety zones. And so when we're saying lookouts, um, especially if we're like up in the Sierra Nevadas and we're burning on a hillside where some people are on one side of the hill and some people are on the other, making sure that there's somebody in between who can see um, everybody and make sure that we're, you know, nobody's putting themselves in danger. Communications, some way to be able to talk to each other or relay information escape routes, um, making sure that if everything goes bad, we know where to go to get out and be safe. And then a safety zone, a place that we can go where um, it's we're not going to be in trouble uh, if everything goes south. And usually that ends up being the, the black once we've burned a big enough black area. Or, um, you know, if we're burning off the side of a road, a road or a pond or whatever we have available to us to be able to... Um, to be able to escape if things go really, really bad. And so when you put it all together, um, you should start off with a briefing, like we talked about, that, that planning and logistics part. So bringing everybody in together, 
making sure everybody's on the same page, making sure everybody knows what equipment we have available to us, what we have in terms of lookouts, how we're going to communicate, what the escape routes are, what the safety zone is, and making sure not only communications is not just saying like let's have radios or let's have a person relay signals. Um, communications is making sure everybody is on the same page, everybody is together, everybody knows their jobs, everybody is confident in what they're doing, and nobody is surprised uh, about what's going to happen. And that way, um, that's really going to lead to making sure a prescribed fire is is done and done to the best of our ability. And so just kind of summarizing the idea of the equipment. So uh, going for our, kind of our basic wildland fire outfit. So we've got on the, the Nomex shirt and the Nomex pants, everything tucked in as best we can. Notice even the sleeves here uh, tucked into the leather glove. Not so much on that side, but, you know, it might be a long day. Uh, if we're wearing a shirt underneath as best we can, uh, close closest to 100% cotton, we've got our um, helmet. Um, this one has a face shield attached to it that she can unfold and then cover up her face if necessary. Eye protection, maybe some ear protection if uh, need be. Um, we have uh, in this, this is a little bit older picture, so this is that belt weather kit, but now she might just have a Kestrel with her instead and we got on our leather gloves we got our drip torch and if we weren't the igniter or the burner we'd have a hand tool with us or um, a backpack pump or we're or we're the person on the the ATV maybe pulling the the water tank and so then just what does that look like when you put it all together so this is a burn I did last year on Southern California Edison lands um, up in Shaver Lake and just to kind of give you guys an idea I went as part of a, um, a class um, through the uh, University of California Cooperative Extension 